you would in this neighborhood. You're going to get more people out for a neighborhood gathering than you would on your block or on your street. But you're never going to get as high a percentage of participation than if you involve people right on your own street. Right? Because if it's citywide, people are going to say, so, somebody else is going to take care of that. If it's on your block, who's going to do it if I don't step up? And if I don't get involved, my neighbor's going to know I'm not involved. You're going to be in trouble. Child care is easier. Transportation's easier. And you're actually going to see the impacts from your involvement. You're going to realize some, some benefits. Second start, the part of starting where people are is to start with their language and culture. Now, when I was doing community organizing in a very low-income, multicultural community, I was really clear I needed an interpreter, I needed a translator. But even if everybody in the neighborhood is speaking English, we need to be clear we're speaking the same English that they're speaking. And increasingly, we use our increasingly professionalized, specialized language. We use really fancy terms like asset-based community development to mean something really simple, which is just build on your strength. And when people don't understand what we're talking about, they think they don't have enough expertise to get engaged, or they don't know what the topic is even. Secondly, to be focused on their culture. But again, the community I was organizing was very multicultural. It took me a long time to figure out why the Jewish community wasn't showing up to our annual meetings on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Third, to focus on their networks. Oftentimes, we think our community association is the only show in town. When I was organizing in Rainier Valley, I thought, man, I organized because they didn't have a community association, and they didn't have a voice with, with council. I said, I've got to organize people so they have a community association that can have power. I had a lot of success, but it was a lot of work going house to house trying to recruit people. I finally woke up to the fact that everybody was already organized. They just didn't belong to a community association. And people only have so much time in their lives. And they have the relationships within their existing network. And our associations tend to be one kind of people. In Seattle, our neighborhood associations tend to be whiter, more middle class, more homeowners, more middle aged than the neighborhood as a whole. They try to reach out, but it's hard because the leadership's been set, the agenda's set, the language is set, the relationships are set, so people who are different don't feel that comfortable coming in. So if we really want to get broad, inclusive engagement, we need to identify what other networks are there in our neighborhood. And particularly, what are those networks that involve people who are underrepresented in our organization? So parent-teacher associations are a fantastic way to reach out. Faith-based organizations are a great way to reach a lot of people you wouldn't reach otherwise. Sporting groups, neighborhood watches, hobby groups. There are hundreds and hundreds of formal and informal associations in every neighborhood. So identifying what those are and starting to bring them together is incredibly powerful. Fourth, to focus on their passions, to start with their passions. Too often times we lead with what we're passionate about or what we get paid to be passionate about or what we got a grant to be passionate about. <laughs> and then when nobody joins us, we say, God, people are apathetic. <laughs> nobody is apathetic. Everybody cares deeply about something. So if we really want to get people engaged, it's much better to start with a question than with an answer. What are your dreams for your family, for your community? What keeps you awake at night? You can really tap into what people care most deeply about, give them a sense they can do something about it. They're much more likely to get involved than if you spend a lot of time trying to convince them to care about what you care about. And then uh, fifth, start with their call. I learned this from a friend who's a duck hunter. My wife hates this story because she's a bird watcher. <laughs> but it's the same principle. Every duck will respond to a call. There's just a different call for every duck. So there's one for the loons, and there's one for the coots, and there's one for the mallards, and one for the mergansers, and one for the wood ducks. Every duck will respond. My friend says, too often times, we just sound the loon call, and we wonder why only loons show up at our meetings. <laughs> she said, in fact, everybody will come, we just need to sound their call. And it, too often times, the call we use is the mating call. I didn't say the mating call, mating call would be kind of interesting, right? <laughs> but the meeting call, and for a lot of people, that is the worst call in the world. Yeah. People know they come to that first meeting, they're going to be in the sign-in sheet, and they're going to be sentenced to meetings for the rest of their lives. <laughs> And a lot of people don't see results from meetings. One meeting just leads to another meeting, leads to another meeting, leads to another meeting. Nothing ever changes. 
And a lot of people are shy. They told look, if you really care about your community, you're going to come to our meetings. So they come. And they just sit there. They don't feel like they're contributing anything. That's how much they care to actually show up. So the most effective communities are the ones that use the full range of calls. For those people who feel shy, they may feel comfortable as a volunteer. Volunteering one-on-one -on -one as a tutor, as a mentor, making a difference in somebody's life. We all know the social call works. People come out for music, for food, for booze. And we should apologize, because the purpose is to build relationships. My favorite call is the project call. Because with projects, unlike with meetings, it's a short-term commitment. There's always a result. There's a role for everybody, for young people, elders, people with disabilities, artists, construction workers, architects, everybody. And in the process, people build relationships. And once people build relationships, then they're more likely to come to some meetings because we need some meetings as well. Not nearly as many as we have, but we need some meetings. The problem is we always lead with the meetings and wonder why the same people keep showing up. <laughs> We're often trying to engage community before we build community. And those other calls are the best way to build community.